Welcome to the Dr. America Show here on the We Act Radio Network. I am your host, Dr. Sanjeev Sriram. Thanks for joining us again, guys. So we have a lot to cover in this episode. A lot of different kinds of things are happening in the world and news of health and lots to go over. So I'm just going to jump right in, get right to it. So one of the first things I wanted to cover was a battle of op-eds that's been happening in a local newspaper called The Hill. Uh, that's a pretty uh, important uh, piece of publication that's read here in the D.C. metro area. And the reason why it's so important is because it gets wide circulation on Capitol Hill, where a lot of members of Congress, their staff members, uh, read the opinions and thoughts and ideas of the writers. And they do invite other professionals to come in author op-eds and uh, give their take on what's going on with uh, legislation or what's going on with current events and issues. So this month, uh, we we had a battle of the op-eds over guns. And it started with an April 1st op-ed that was written by uh, Mr. Dan Gross of the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence and Dr. George Benjamin, who is the executive director of the American Public Health Association. Now, the two of them um, pretty much, you know, decided, well, wrote that, you know, gun deaths and in, and gun injuries are a public health issue. And in their op-ed, they lay their case. They, you know, make it clear about why this is a public health issue. And then they also talked about how the American Public Health Association and the Brady Campaign are leading a coalition of health professionals, safety experts, uh, gun safety advocates, a whole bunch of different groups are coming together and they met last month and they really wanted to try to address this issue of how do we prevent people from dying and getting injured by guns. And it's a really important conversation that they, um, you know, are spearheading and well, some would say continuing, some would say spearheading. But nonetheless, you know, they gathered people together to work on this and to lay out strategies and plans for what could these organizations do as organizations, as private citizens, and also to you know ask what their federal government could do. And so uh, Mr. Gross and Dr. Benjamin wrote this article together in the in the, the Hill and you know they lay out some really important um, statistics. And so you know they were saying that based on the latest fatal injury data released by the CDC, Uh, they found that gun deaths overall have increased for the fourth year in a row to 33,636 in the year 2013. Now, what they found was that that was primarily that rise in gun deaths was primarily due to a 2.5% increase in suicide by guns across all age groups. And, you know, so, I mean, what we've talked about on this program before is that, you know, this, I mean, like, just even doing this data collection and research is extremely important. We have to be able to figure out, you know, how are guns injuring people, which groups are most at risk, and how do we help those groups? And this is pretty much what the American Public Health Association and the Brady Campaign have wanted to start the conversation on, because they're also pointing out that there's an economic impact to all of this. In 2010, the economic economic impact of firearm related incidents was more than 174 billion dollars in both healthcare and societal costs so they're not looking at just the cost of the doctor doing the work in the emergency room or in the operating room where they're taking a bullet out of you, they're looking at, okay, what are the costs that are happening to the families and loved ones of the person who is injured or who is killed by this gun? They're looking at, okay, when that person is injured so badly that they're not able to go back to work or that they become permanently disabled, what is the economic impact of that as far as loss to job you know, productivity and things like that, which... You know, you can see that there is like, you know, ripple effects. And so it's very tough to collect this data, but it's really important. And $174 billion just in 2010 alone is the economic impact of of gun deaths and injuries in this country. And, you know, I mean, the the goal that they have is really to keep up these conversations and to start looking at, okay, what are the things that we can do as our or as our own organizations, as private citizens, as groups of concerned citizens working together, what can we do to work together? 
And they don't bring this up in the article, but I want to kind of give you guys an example of how this doesn't have to necessarily be so contentious. Um, I had I was actually informed by um, you know the American Academy of Pediatrics that their Utah State chapter worked with a lot of gun a, a, a lot of um, a, of gun sellers. These are the you know people who sell guns, <laughs> and uh, and basically you know they they got groups of you know people together because they even acknowledged among pediatricians that these are pediatricians who own guns themselves, who when they were kids they were around guns. They they recognize that they live in a western state where things like hunting, skeet shooting, you know, I mean, and where their, you know, history and culture have, you know, a connection to firearms. And of course, you know, the people who sell the guns also have an interest in staying in business. And what they were able to do as, you know, healthcare providers and as gun sellers was have a civil conversation about Okay, what do gun sellers need to know about children that makes them particularly vulnerable to gun injuries? And then what do pediatricians need to know about the things that are being sold by, you know, by, you know, by gun sellers, by the people who are, you know, part of that industry? What do pediatricians need to know about those products? And they were actually able to find like a really interesting, you know, common ground where pediatricians were able to encourage the gun sellers to promote products like gun locks, trigger locks, you know, gun boxes like, you know, lockers that actually keep the gun stored locked. They were able to encourage gun sellers to promote simple messages of how to safely store a gun, how to safely store ammunition, how to safely store the two separately. And while these were not necessarily always popular with the customers, they were at least able to come together to understand that, look, like, you know, we don't necessarily have to be opponents in this issue, that there is some common ground here where, the, like, you know, these two groups can coexist. And in fact, they're not necessarily even all that opposed to each other. The number of Utah doctors, I was surprised, the number of Utah doctors who, you know, either own guns themselves, grew up around guns, have no, pro you have nothing against guns themselves. Themselves, I was actually, you know, surprised that there were that many people who had that kind of a comfort level in the medical profession around guns. And I mean, it, it does happen. Now, the reason why I bring up this example is that, like, that is a, it's an example of a productive dialogue that happens in a civil space that maybe doesn't get like a ton of media play simply because it's not a conflict. It's not really all that sexy to watch two groups that are supposedly, you know, at loggerheads with each other get together and talk their differences out and work together on a plan to make everybody safer. I get it. That is not really, you know, like that doesn't make for entertaining TV. It's not the same thing as watching Empire or watching, you know, I mean, like Kim Kardashian. This is not that it's not going to compete with that. But the thing is, is that this is the way public health works. Public health works sometimes in some boring ways. I mean, it's interesting that those of us who are in it, but yeah, it doesn't always make for great ratings and, you know, and TV, but it can be done. And this is, and, you know, coming back to what Dr. Benjamin and Mr. Gross were writing about was that there is a lot of room for this kind of potential. It starts with being able to ask healthcare providers, ask public health officials, what do we know about gun injuries and what have we done in the past with things like car injuries, motor vehicle accidents, tobacco? What strategies and methods have worked before that we might be able to apply in this situation? And, you know, I mean, one of the things that I found really interesting about their approach was that they really wanted to, you know, do what to me looks like a three pronged approach. They say that they want to make the gun safer. They want to make the environment with the guns safer and they want to make the people safer when they have guns and thus save lives. Now, that to me sounds like it's pretty level headed. 
you know, to make guns safer is actually not all that different from the ways that public health people got involved with making cars safer and actually making it possible for doctors to remind parents, hey, you need to get your kid into a car seat. Yeah, the, I mean, like, and then we went from like, okay, there's an infant car seat to a toddler car seat. We started to figure out, okay, there's an age where it's safe to put the kid in the front seat. And before that age, it's not all that safe. We've started learning that, you know, there were tons of things like that the research showed us that we were able to turn into good advice to families so they could stay safe on the road. And it made the cars safer when we started encouraging both laws and manufacturers to get together and work towards this goal of safety. So just like the cars change, I think that what these groups are wanting to do, people like the Brady Campaign and the American Public Health Association, is look at the gun as a consumer product and try to make it safer. As far as like the environment, like, you know, to make the environment, you know, where guns are safer or, you know, is to really kind of be in the know about who is carrying what? Are they licensed to? Are they trained to? And what does it mean when you see somebody walking around with a firearm? Right now, we still have this ugly habit of the wild, wild west where there are some states where you can open carry a loaded weapon and walk around with it. And, you know, people are left wondering. They have no concept of, like... Are you in a, are you the next mass shooter? Are you really just a concerned citizen? Is that a toy? Like nobody like you know we don't really have a good productive you know conversation right now about you know our environment. And when we see a gun we don't really have good ideas about how to react. I mean a lot of us because of the way that we've been kind of like you know learning from the news about gun violence, we think of the worst. Now it doesn't always have to be that way, but in order for us to kind of like have these dialogues to start looking at like you know i mean reassessing is a gun a threat or not we have to have an opening honest dialogue and discussion about our environment and what like you know guns mean in it and as far as like making the people safer i think this kind of comes back to this you know debate that's been going on for the last couple of years of doctors being able to ask their patients do you have a gun in the home if it's a parent and you've got a little kid and you're trying to like you know make sure that that kid doesn't wander into a situation where there is an you know unlocked loaded gun you, pediatricians have an interest in wanting to you know protect them from that it's not all that different from when a pediatrician asks about a car seat in your car it's not all that different when you know we ask things like how do you store your chemicals how do you store your medications and yeah it's not to say that we wiped out those problems of you know car accidents or accidental ingestions or you know poisonings and things like that by no means have we have we wiped those problems out just by asking but at the very least it in the families where those lives have been saved it's because people have done a little bit of thinking when they've gone home and that's all that physicians want they want to be able to help parents with little kids. They want to be able to help patients who are struggling with, you know, mental health issues where depression can sometimes get the better of you on a bad day. I mean, you know, doctors are not there every single day when a patient is dealing with depression. And we don't live in the kind of society where we institutionalize someone for, you know, for feeling sad or for feeling moody. But we would like to know that when they go home, they aren't at risk for hurting themselves or hurting a loved one because of a gun. So anyway, I know this has been a long explanation of, you know, um, of Mr. Uh, of, <clears throat> sorry, Dr. Benjamin and uh, Mr. Gross's article. But, you know, I, I mean, as you can tell, I feel pretty passionately that, yes, you know, gun deaths, injuries, they are a public health issue, you know, and as a public health, I mean, you know, policy person, as a pediatrician, as a physician, I mean, I feel that this is an appropriate discussion for us to have. Now, not everybody feels this way. <laughs> and so uh, yesterday we had in the same uh, newspaper, The Hill. Uh, let's see. Let me get make sure I'm getting this guy's name right. Mr. Lawrence Keene. He's the senior vice president and general counsel for the National Shooting Sports Foundation wrote about how treating guns as a public health issue remains wrongheaded. And he basically, I mean, the, ju the, the gist of his article is that he wants doctors and public health people to stay in their lane. Now, you know, the thing about staying in our lane is that, like, this has been a, a, an issue that we've had to confront 
time and again by big industries. You know, back when um, when we were, you know, I mean, this is like in the 1960s and earlier when we were trying to learn more about how does tobacco affect health. I can tell you right now, you know, Big Tobacco was not happy about doctors, you know, doing this research. They were not happy about doctors having these conversations with with, with patients. They were really not happy about the Surgeon General coming out with a label on their product. And that particular issue of putting the Surgeon General's warning on every pack of cigarettes you know, it raised all these kinds of questions. What the heck does a doctor know about marketing cigarettes? What do they know about our business? What do you know? What do public people think they're doing? And it was again that whole question of: Are doctors and people in public health are they staying in their lane? Are they extending their reach too far? Now, I think that most of us, when you look back at the fifty years of work that has happened with big tobacco, I think most people would be quite happy with the work that public health and doctors have done with you know making tobacco smoking and preventing it and reducing it as a you know as a public health problem i think most people would be pretty happy with the work that we did i think most people would say that we're not wandering out of our lane it wasn't always like that though i mean it was a time when like you know when the first doctors had to kind of like start asking these uncomfortable questions and mind you they were having to ask these uncomfortable questions to their own people like doctors were smoking back then there were doctors who are on those old old posters and advertisement for cigarettes and it's a doctor with a with a cigarette in his mouth and we had to ask each other in our in our profession we had to ask like is this the right thing for our patients are we doing right by them is this whole tobacco thing something that we need to take more seriously? Now, these are conversations that started in the 60s, and it seems strange that they were so hard to do back then because of what we know now. But if imagine if, like, you know, if doctors had been scared away by the big tobacco industry. Imagine if they had said, like, you know what? You're right. Sorry, big tobacco. We're going to get back in our lane right now. And, um, you know, we're going to be like just like dealing with heart attacks and lung disease as they arise. And, you know, we're not going to swim upstream and kind of find a way to prevent all that. We're just going to deal with it when it walks into our clinic. Now, you can imagine, first off, how ridiculous that sounds. But secondly, how irresponsible that is to the culture of public health and to even just the way that Americans problem solve things. We don't just let things slide when we can see just a little bit upstream. There's something there that is worth investigating, something that's worth looking at. And we did the same thing again with, you know, with motor vehicles. When you look at like how speed limits came to be, the auto industry wasn't thrilled about it. Like, you know, there were plenty of motorists who weren't really excited about the idea of having either a state speed limit or a national speeding limit. A lot of them weren't crazy about it, you know, but... At the end of the day, we found out that yes, when you like when you put speed limits, when you put car seats in place, when you put like laws that mandate that you must wear a seatbelt, not that seatbelts are a good idea and you should try to do it as best you can, but that no, you must wear a seatbelt. It saved lives. It made a difference. And yeah, public health cares about that kind of thing. And yeah, at first it looked like public health was wandering out of its lane. But, you know, now it's common practice for pediatricians to ask, are you using a car seat? Are you wearing a seat? Uh, you know, are you wearing a seat belt? You know, I mean, and yes, it, I mean, like there are things that like, you know, a lot of these questions, things like asking, do you have a gun in the home might seem uncomfortable. And I know that that question is not popular. I've seen, you know, a poll done by an or. It's been done by NPR. These like you can hardly call it, you know, a conservative, I mean, like organization. NPR actually polled people about like, OK, how do you feel about doctors asking, you know, whether you have a gun in the home? Overwhelming. I mean, and I, I would say about like, you know, it was roughly split between a third, a third and a third. There was like about a third to like one half somewhere in there. There were people who felt, no, doctors shouldn't be asking about that. I get it. It's not a popular question, but it doesn't change the fact that it's an important question. And that's probably the toughest part of all of this, right? Because, you know, you're I mean, like doctors oftentimes have to do tough work where they have to tell you the truth. But at the same time, that truth might not please you. 
And this is the challenge, I think, that for a lot of public health advocates, not just doctors, but for a lot of public health advocates, is that we have to, like, you know, find a way to tell the truth and please the crowd at the same time when, in fact, that doesn't always happen. Truth telling and cloud pleasing, crowd pleasing is very rarely an overlap between those things. It's very rare for, I mean, for the crowd to be pleased by a tough truth. More often than not, those things exist separately. And there are people who are great at both and, you know, and who try to take advantage of a situation where it might please a crowd to tell doctors to butt out of the gun conversation. But it isn't the truth. It isn't really the way that we're going to save lives because we're looking at 2015 becoming the year where gun deaths start to outnumber motor vehicle deaths. And you know what? When you look at like how motor vehicle deaths have been on a steady decline, it's because we had civil dialogue between groups of people having you know truthful conversations that weren't always that popular, that weren't always that easy, but were very necessary. And this is the, and this is basically what we're dealing with when it comes to guns. So, you know, I find it interesting that Mr. Keene, you know, wants to basically tell doctors to, you know, stay in their lane. And he actually even says doctors should concentrate on genuine public health concerns. And then, you know, he's like saying that, like, you know, the return of once nearly conquered childhood illnesses such as measles. Okay, to inadequate infection control protocols leading to unnecessary deaths in hospitals, and then perennial issues such as obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Now, it's interesting that he's, you know, as a lawyer for the National Shooting Sports Foundation, he's wandering into the public health realm. But you know what? I'm actually not going to tell him to, you know, stay in his lane. What I am going to say is, is that, okay, you've wandered into public health territory and you've listed off some things. Okay, well, let's see. You know, yes, we have seen a return of measles. And that's because, you know what, we got a little bit too lax about people getting vaccine exemptions. We instead of, you know, where we before had mandates on like you must get vaccinated if you want your child to go to school, which, by the way, like, you know, we're I mean, are clearly not all that popular. And we'll get a little bit more into that in the next segment. But the thing is, is that like, yeah, there, I mean, like, you know, every kid getting like, you know, vaccinated didn't always like, you know, appeal to everybody. It's not an instant crowd pleaser, you know. But yeah, like, you know, people bit the bullet, they ate their vegetables and they got vaccinated. They I mean, they did what they had to do. You know, now the thing is, is that like you have to understand, Mr. Keene, that when doctors are trying to like do something unpopular, like talk about guns, it's kind of in a similar realm. We're having an, uh, you know, a difficult discussion about something that's kind of, you know, in a zone that makes people uncomfortable, but it's for their own good. It's for their own health. And that's the intention here. We're not really, I, I mean, you know, people aren't sitting in judgment. Most doctors aren't, like, you know, sitting in judgment of their patients when they ask about guns. They're sitting in assessment of their safety. But, you know, you bring up measles, you bring up, you know, obesity, diabetes, heart disease. You know, these are all things, that, especially when it comes to the heart disease part. My argument about, like, you know, the issue of smoking, that when doctors and public health people wandered out of their lane and talked about, like, you know what, let's not market, like, you know, cigarettes to kids. Let's get rid of Joe the camel. Let's, you know, like put a Surgeon General warning on every packet of cigarettes and on every magazine ad when it comes to like, you know, I mean, tobacco advertisements. We went so far as to make sure that tobacco advertising was off of TV, you know, I mean, like and yeah, guess what? You know, smoking related deaths and heart disease and lung cancer are improving because public health and, uh, you know, people, doctors got together wandered a little bit out of their lane for the safety and good and health of their patients. So it's interesting, Mr. Keene, that you care so much about doctors doing their work to prevent heart disease when, in fact, we have a proven track record of public health interventions that were outside of our clinical realm and did wonders for reducing heart disease and reducing lung disease for, you know, for patients. Now, when it comes to, you know, looking at how the public feels about whether, you know, I mean, gun violence is a, is a public health issue or not, I guess he likes to point to the survey where an overwhelming majority of the American people, when asked, they felt that gun violence is a criminal justice issue. Now, I can tell you that, like, you know, 
I mean, they don't really feel that. And then they also went on further to say that a majority of people don't feel the federal government should be classifying gun violence as a public health issue. Okay. Here's the thing. Let's come back to the traffic issue thing for a second here. Most people, when they think about, you know, I mean, safety and public health, a lot of them don't immediately think of traffic issues. Most of them think that that's also kind of a law enforcement job. They usually think that that's like a transportation department job. Many people aren't thinking about, you know, the Center for Disease Prevention going after like, you know, traffic, I mean, you know, traffic injury and traffic death data. But you know what? It's a good thing that they did. It's a good thing that they did figure out like, okay, when kids are like, you know, in car seats versus seat belts, it makes a difference for for certain age groups. It makes a difference when we actually enforce really strict drunk driving laws. We actually were able to give law enforcement some sense of direction on how we need to manage traffic. Now, I can tell you that like, you know, public health didn't like, you know, ruin the world of driving for everyone. Far from it. You know, it's just that we decided, like, you know, we offered some guidance on things that, like, yeah, when you're near a school, you know, maybe you should drive at about 20 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour. But we didn't say that you need to drive 15 to 20 miles per hour on the 405 freeway or any of the other freeways. We know that that's impractical. We know that it's totally impractical. Now, it's, is it safe? Absolutely. It's probably safer if you drove 15 miles an hour everywhere. But we all know that that is like ridiculously impractical. So looking at how impractical that is, how do we still continue to keep you safe in your car? By airbags car seats, vehicle design. These are all things that like the car manufacturers worked with the data to actually build a better product. I don't see the gun manufacturers doing anything like that. And this is all that the public health community is trying to ask. They're not trying to get rid of everybody's gun. And they're not trying to stigmatize people that own guns. What they are trying to do is that if you are a person with some history of mental illness, it should be safe for your doctor to ask you, do you have a gun at home? How is it stored? You know, do we need to talk about maybe getting you some help about, you know, how you store that weapon and whether a weapon is a good idea at this time? You know, kind of the way that we, you know, help our patients with epilepsy when they have seizures. We kind of have to tell them, look, like maybe driving is not a good idea for you right now. That doesn't mean that you never get to drive again. That means that we need to get your seizures under control so that you can get behind the wheel of a car and not be a danger to everybody else. It's the same kind of advice. As you can see, I I mean, you know, when public health and doctors wander out of their lane, to go into these issues of public health and safety, it hasn't been like this thing where other consumer products like, you know, cars, cigarettes, you know, I mean, like toys, swimming pools, I mean, like, you know, cleaning products, you name it. We've been able to give advice. We've been able to, you know, I mean, like guide people on safety, but they still get to own all these things. You know, I mean, capitalism doesn't fall apart. Democracy doesn't fall apart. America is still here. You know, we seem to react like we seem to react so differently when it comes to just guns. And why is that? Like, you know, it's not that we can't have that conversation. As I was pointing out before, in Utah, it is possible to get people together, have a civil dialogue and work on some issues together. And like I was pointing out before, not everything that public health wants to do should be applied widely. As I mean, you know, we don't need to have a 15 mile per hour speed limit everywhere. We need to have a 15 mile per hour speed limit next to schools, next to hospitals. You know, we need to decide that, okay, if you're under the age of 16, you might be able to take driver's ed in a classroom, but you don't get to get behind the wheel of a car. Even when you do get behind the wheel of a car, it helps to have a grown up, an adult in there with you. We like have figured out all of these li- like little, little steps, but we don't necessarily have any aim at completely upending how people use products. I mean, when was the last time you saw a grown up with another grown up in the car you know, because I mean, like, you know, it, would it be safer? Maybe. But like, you know, that's not what public health is demanding. You know, all we're asking for is some opportunities to do some research, learn from our experiences and make some recommendations. So honestly, I encourage you guys, like, take a look at both of these op-eds in The Hill. I think that, you know, they're, I mean, they're interesting pieces of reading. And I think that there is a middle ground there, which I feel is very safe, very sane and very reasonable. 
you know, and I think it is going to require that we, you know, I mean, take a look at like telling the truth and pleasing the crowd and understanding that if you can't always get what you want, can you live with something to get with what you need so that, you know, we can all be safe and healthy. So that's my first issue of uh, of this week's show. My second issue is um, is actually not that disconnected. <laughs> I'm going to rip into the anti-vaxxers again. You know I love to do this because you know how strongly I feel about vaccines. It's almost like if I had to compete between whether I am more crazy about the gun nuts or the anti-vaxxers, that's actually a real coin toss right there. But it's funny, anti-vaxxers, you seem to have like made me realize that you have an interesting connection to the gun nuts. So let me rewind a little bit and let's go to California, where in California, the state Senate has been looking at legislation that would wipe out parent exemptions from sorry, parental exemptions from the vaccine mandates that there is actually a pediatrician who is a state senator, Dr. Richard Pan, who has proposed legislation that would basically remove like m- almost all of the parental exemptions from the vaccine mandates. It's called SB 277. And as you can imagine, this like pissed off the anti-vaxxers like no other to the point where, you know, they lost their minds. And yes, I am saying that, you know, I mean, for reals, because according to, you know, I mean, according to the uh, security people at the at the Sacramento State House, they had to step up security because Dr. Richard Pan, a state senator and pediatrician trying to write laws to make sure that the measles outbreak never happens again, this gentleman was receiving death threats left and right from the anti-vaxxer crowd. So anti-vaxxers apparently decided to just lose their minds over some, you know, very simple legislation that would make sure that the measles outbreak never, ever, ever happened ever again in California. And, you know, as you can imagine, I'm pretty much in favor of this legislation. Now, the thing is that we're recording this on a Tuesday and tomorrow is a Wednesday. And that's when the state Senate needs to kind of take a look at some of they made a couple of little revisions, apparently, like the, you know, the bill was going to go up for a Senate vote, then it went back to a committee. And we're going to have to kind of take a look and see what some of these, you know, revisions are. But it, from what it sounds like, they're going to try to make it a little bit more clear that if you have a religious objection to vaccines, that you will still be allowed to have an exemption, but you might have to follow certain rules. It's going to definitely be clear. I mean, what it looks like is going to happen is that if you are seeking an exemption from the from the laws guiding vaccines, it's going to be very tough for you to get that exemption. And actually, this is one of those public health laws that does wonders. There are states where it's actually very, very tough to get an exemption. And those states have very, very, very few outbreaks of diseases. And so we know that this works and we know that, you know, religious freedom doesn't fall apart in those states that have these strict kind of, you know, I mean, uh, vaccine laws. And I'm really hoping that the people in California get it together, support SB 277 and make this law. Now, the reason why I'm not really worried about us, you know, doing the show on a Tuesday and the Senate vote coming up on a Wednesday is that. Almost regardless of what the Senate decides to do, the anti-vaxxers are going to continue their temper tantrum. And I'm imagining that if SB 277 becomes law, what will probably happen is that it will be taken to court, that the anti-vaxxers will more than likely decide to sue the state of California over this, you know, terrible, terrible law. Now, the thing is, is that, like, you know, the thing that bothers me the most about this is that like the anti-vaxxers like welcome to where you and the gun nuts actually have a lot in common the the sad truth of the matter is is that your child cannot bring a gun to school and i don't think that your child should be allowed to bring measles to school it's as simple as that i can imagine that there is a parent out there in california who is and honestly anti-vaxxers this is what you are inviting by opposing a law like this there's going to probably be some parent in california who is looking at their little one going off to kindergarten and they're going to be thinking to themselves well i don't know when the next school shooting is going to happen i want to send him to school with the gun so that he can protect himself that's my personal belief and it is my parental right now the thing is is that this parent is going to be pointing to the constitution 
which quite frankly, anti-vaxxers, you don't even have that. Like you don't even have like there's not a constitutional amendment that supports you on this. There's just like cultural mumbo jumbo that like, you know, you guys have inflamed to try to make a case. But you do see how what a dangerous slippery slope you are putting the rest of us on right now. I mean, just like, you know, your kid can't bring a gun to school, your kid can't be bringing measles to school. It's as simple as that. The thing is, is that, like, you know, just like we have to tell the person who wants to send a firearm with their child to school, look, that's not allowed. That's dangerous for kids. We can't, we're not okay with that. If that's how, if you feel that strongly about it, maybe public school isn't the way to go. Unfortunately, this is kind of where we're at right now with you anti-vaxxers. We have to have the same kind of conversation. Look, you know, we have a bunch of kids here at school. Measles is not something that we want to, like, you know, risk them getting. If you have a problem with that, maybe public school isn't exactly the thing for you. You see how this works? We have to have a set of rules that are unpopular to a few people, no matter what those rules are. But the rules are there to protect the greater good of the kids. You know, it's not really. And this is once again coming back to that conflict between, you know, telling the truth and and pleasing the crowd. You can't always have both. It's not like every kid gets to go and decide when they want to have recess and when they want to have math and when they want to have spelling. It doesn't work like that. There are some kids where, like, you know, they hate the end of recess. That doesn't mean that they get to, like, have recess indefinitely. It means that they have to kind of suck it up come back to class and do some math, do some spelling, kind of like everybody else has to do. This is something that we should have learned all the way back in grade school. And it's interesting that grade school is where some of these like very basic fights are happening because I think that this like simple like the simple idea that not every rule is going to please every single person on earth and that's really not the standard by which we should be passing legislation. California, honestly, I don't know what to tell you guys when it comes to like listening to some of these anti-vaxxers. I know that, you know, a lot of you are like, you know, not even from the conservative wing of the political spectrum. You're actually hearing from people who are on the far left. And just like I've taken it out on like, you know, the right wing nuts, I guess I have to take it out on the left wing nuts. The truth is, if you're a legislator in California, if you're like, you know, part of any kind of PTA, school board, you name it. And if you're able to kind of like listen to this program and listen to some of this advice, understand that like, you know, there's a pretty good chance that you're one of those people who is for climate is for the science of climate change in the sense that you believe in it, in the sense that you trust what it's saying, you know, that you see it as science, that you agree that when there's 95 percent of scientists who are saying that, like, yeah, man-made activity is resulting in a change in the climate that you know, you agree with that. Well, this time, like there's over 90 something percent of doctors who are agreeing that the vaccines are a good way to prevent measles. And no, they don't cause autism. That same kind of scientific consensus is there. And we are needing you to be champions of that, no matter how unpopular you might be with the few people who get vocal on Twitter, Facebook, whatever. You know, this is what you have to stand up for. And again, Telling the truth and pleasing the crowd is not always easy, but it's necessary. This is, the, you know, this is our kid's health at stake here. Honestly, just like you, I mean, you know, your kid can't bring a gun to school and no, your kid can't bring measles to school. You know, I mean, it's like, yeah, saying tough luck to people is really hard. And I don't mean to be apathetic necessarily. It's just that like, you know, we're talking about like guns, measles. These are things that people shouldn't be dying of in America in 2015. So if we're trying to find some middle ground here, there does have to eventually come a point where, you know, the enough compromises have been made. You know, when we are talking about these like, you know, vaccine exemptions, like, yeah, I disagree with people who want to seek a, you know, a religious personal belief about, you know, I mean, getting exempt from vaccines. But if you're willing to go through the work, if you're willing to find like, you know, a member, a, a leader, a local leader of your religion, a clergy member, a rabbi, imam, whoever. And if they're willing to say like, yeah, this person like, you know, has like, a, I mean, has such and such experiences with their faith. They live by their faith and this is how they feel about vaccines and I support it and they need to be exempt. If you're willing to go through all that process to prove that, you know, your integrity on this one. Then I guess, yeah, I have to, at the end of the day, like, you know, suck it up and deal that maybe, you know, I mean, you're not going to, you're going to send your kid to school unvaccinated. Now, 
I don't think that everybody can, you know, can really be like misusing a religious belief exemption like that. And that's why I do think it needs to be tough to do, you know. And this eventually is coming back to this middle ground here, right? Like, you know, you might be unhappy with like, you know, where this all this stuff ends up, whether that's guns, whether that's vaccines, you might be unhappy. But at the end of the day, you know, if you were willing to slow down next to the school while you were driving, I'd like to think that maybe you're not willing to send your kid to school with a gun or to send your kid to school with the measles. All right. I know that's been a lot. We've covered a lot of, you know, in this first segment of the show. When we come back, we're going to switch gears a little bit. You've been listening to the Dr. America show here on the We Act Radio Network. I am your host, Sanjeev Sriram, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Listening to We Act Radio, WPWC 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Dr. America show here on the We Act Radio Network. I am your host, Dr. Sanjeev Sriram. Thanks for coming back. So this episode, we've been covering a lot. (laughs) We've been covering uh, the gun nuts. We've been covering the anti-vaxxers. And, you know, um, one of the other things I wanted to cover in this episode was that April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. I know, I know. I've got all the really fun topics, all the really upbeat topics between, like, guns and measles and now we're going to talk about sexual assault. Um, and I don't mean to make light of the subject because of that. I just um, want folks to kind of know that, you know, we it is April. It is um, Sexual Violence Awareness Month. So, you know, what can we do about this issue? Because, you know, again, this is, again, one of those topics where a lot of people look at it as a law enforcement issue. And a lot of folks are, you know, paying attention to it from the standpoint of how are colleges enforcing uh, the law and what are they doing for perpetrators and victims. Um, and I think that those are really important discussions. I think, you know, I fully support, you know, having conversations about sexual violence in terms of law and order and criminal justice, because uh, we do need to get a better handle on that. But as a physician, I do feel that we need to kind of look at sexual violence also as a public health issue. And, um, and you know, the big reason why is, you know, maybe again kind of coming back to like how, you know, it's, it's tough to see gun violence as a public health issue. And, you know, it's tough to see some of these laws guiding schools sometimes every now and then. It's tough to see it as, um, as a public health issue. But when it comes to sexual violence, you know, um, there is a very heavy health burden that victims of sexual violence deal with. And that is that, you know, it is a it is a way that people um, suffer unintended pregnancies. It's a way that people suffer, uh, you know, sexually transmitted diseases. There's a mental health impact. And, you know, all of these issues do um, require us to pay attention to, Okay, how are we, you know, Um, doing right by victims when it comes to looking at this as a public health issue. But I want to go even one step more a step further and say, okay, what are some public health models? What are some public health approaches that we can take that would actually prevent sexual violence? Because, you know, one of the things that's really missing from the law and order discussions about sexual assault and sexual violence is, you know, that that this problem can be prevented, that we can go further upstream and find, you know, um, causes, risk factors, and address them early. Um, And so, you know, I kind of want to explore some of that in this next segment. So, um, again, why is sexual 
sexual, um, you know, violence, a public health problem, um, you know, I kind of laid out like what are the specific, you know, health burdens that um, that victims suffer. But to kind of give you guys an idea of just how large of a problem this is, I was really shocked by these numbers that were collected by the CDC. And this is 2012 data that I'm looking at here. But when they did a survey of high school students nationwide, they found that among female high school students, 11% had said that they had experienced an incident where sex was forced upon them. 11% of our female high school students have suffered this kind of indignity. And then that number escalates when they surveyed college women. So they found that an estimated 20 to 25% of college women in the United States have experienced an attempted or completed rape during their college career. So, you know, these numbers are simply staggering because we don't, you know, when you look at other types of health diagnoses, you know, the, um, breast cancer can, you know, strike about one in eight women. But when they look at, you know, sexual violence and sexual assault, you know, that number, like, you know, the rate is actually somewhere around like one in three women, one in five. So, you know, sexual violence is all, is a huge threat to um, the well-being of women in the United States. And so it's important to kind of look at it from a public health um, perspective because of all the reasons that I was describing before, but also because, you know, we really need to take a look at like, okay, if this is a public health problem, and it is, then what can we do? What you know? Is there an upstream? Are, is there a way that we can like look at this trajectory further up and identify risk factors that are existent not just for the victim but for the perpetrators, the people who are most at risk of committing an act of sexual violence, and is there a way to mitigate that early? And the answer is actually yes. So it's a, I mean, this is relatively some new work that has been figured out among um, health educators. And they actually found that when you educate uh, young people, especially, you know, middle school and high school students about sexual assault and about, um, you know, um, healthy uh, sexual experiences and sexual orientation, when you actually have honest conversations with them, when you like explain that these are, you know, the risk factors and the problems that you can be facing out there in the world, they actually found that it does impact behavior and that there is a reduction in the incident of sexual violence and sexual assault as these young people go on from being middle school and high school students to being college students and then young professionals. And so when you look at that trajectory, the fact that we can actually do something early on and that it's actually an education tool, that to me is a powerful time for intervention. And that's something that I think that, you know, we have to take advantage of that opportunity. And, you know, back in February, uh, Senators Tim Kaine and uh, Claire McCaskill actually introduced um, a bill that um, our friends over at Ultraviolet, you know, started a petition to um, get support for this bill. And um, and it basically what the uh, Senate Bill 355 would do, it's called the Teach Safe Relationships Act of 2015. And what the the whole point of, you know, of this uh, legislation is that it would require um, health education classes in uh, public schools, like, you know, public high schools, to include and build curriculum on safe relationship behavior. And it's aimed at preventing sexual assault, domestic violence, and dating violence. And um, now, right now, under current federal law, um, health and sex ed classes are not required to include anything about any of these topics. And, you, you know, so the um, and, you know, the big reason why um, senators, uh, you know, Tim Kaine and Claire McCaskill did this was because of the controversies that were being um, revealed at college campuses. And they were, you know, and they were doing the smart thing of looking upstream and asking, OK, what can we do at an earlier point in these young people's lives to prevent sexual violence from happening later in their life? And so they came up with the Teach Safe Relationships Act. 
And right now, the Senate Health Committee, which is the Senate Health, Education, Labor's Pensions Committee, is reviewing the legislation. This is kind of part of the civics process where they want to kind of, um, you know, keep on working on the legislation, construct it, tweak it, do the work that needs to be done. Because, uh, you know, I mean, this is something that is uh, has never really been done before in federal law. So... What I'm encouraging my listeners to do on, you know, it is April. This is um, Sexual Violence Awareness Month. You know, um, you know, come upstream, come upstream and look at this as a problem that can be totally prevented. And that is by teaching our young people what safe relationships are, you know, what are um, the ways that they can protect themselves and, you know, and, and do right by each other. And that's what the Teach Safe Relationships Act is really um, aiming towards. And, you know, if you know that your uh, member of Congress is on the Senate Help Committee, I would, you know, get into, you know, like send them a tweet, go to their Facebook page, let them know that you support this kind of legislation. And this really should not be a partisan issue. It should be that, you know, we're able to look at, you know, public health research, psychology research, medical research, and put together curriculum for young people that helps them construct and maintain healthy, safe relationships so that we can get a handle on sexual assault and sexual violence. There's no reason why our sisters should be experiencing something, you know, so devastating at these such alarming rates, 11% of female high school students, and then it doubles when they go to college, that is simply unacceptable. And we need to be doing everything that we can to even prevent this from being an issue. Um, I totally support, you know, everything that you guys are doing out there to, you know, um, you know, bring uh, perpetrators to justice and to create safe spaces for victims to, you know, tell their stories and for, you know, those uh, proceedings in court to actually happen. Um but, you know, as a public health person, I feel like there are some opportunities that we need to take advantage of, of going upstream and doing right by our young people. And I think the Teach Safe Relationships Act of 2015 is the right way to go. Um, I want to thank, um, you know, my sisters over at Ultraviolet for bringing this to my attention. And um, and this is, uh, you know, a really powerful opportunity for um for activism and advocacy. So please get in touch with your members of the Senate now. Okay, so, um, you know, so that was my take on Sexual Violence um, Awareness Month. And it's actually kind of fitting that um, another achievement that happened in the Senate, um, you know, just uh, just recently is that the Senate actually did the right thing of um, reaching a deal for um, an act called the Justice for Victims of Human Trafficking Act. Um, Now, you would think that something like the Justice for Victims of Human Trafficking Act would be kind of a no-brainer. And in fact, when this law was starting out in the Senate Judiciary Committee, it actually had a, like, you know, total consensus. I mean, there was like a unanimous vote in support of doing right by uh, the victims of uh, human trafficking and for nailing the perpetrators. Um, Unfortunately, in the way that our civics work, um, there was language in the bill that was, you know, going to go way beyond anything that um, previous laws had done with abortion restrictions. And, um, you know, and this was an, you know, this was a, a shortcoming on some, uh, you know, on some of those staff members' part. But it was really just un- like, you know, really ill-conceived and ill-advised uh, legis- like wording in the in the bill that was basically going to say that if a victim of human trafficking needed to get an abortion, no, f- like you know, like even in the event of rape or incest, there would be, there would be no funding for them. That was, I mean, and you would think that this is kind of ridiculous. This is a victim of human trafficking cannot get, you know, I mean, the the reproductive health care and the health rights that they that they need when they have more than likely been the victim of rape. I mean, this is human trafficking we're talking about here. And um, and, you know, and this was um, it became a bigger and bigger deal because, you know, the Republicans who wanted to make sure that, you know, there was absolutely no funding for abortion, no way, no how were using this piece of legislation is that they were saying that if we do if we cannot reach an agreement on this, then we're not going to talk about um, the uh, nominee for attorney general, um, Loretta Lynch. And so they were using this bill 
to block a discussion on getting us a new um, attorney general. And uh, Democrats, you know, when they realized that they had, you know, not quite like read all the language of the of the law and realized that, you know, that this was going to be restricting access to abortion for, um, you know, for human trafficking victims who more than likely had been raped and more than likely were, you know, probably going to be needing some kind of reproductive health care. Um, you know, Democrats said that, well, we can't support the law if that language that is so extreme is not taken out. So the good news that happened was that actually, like, you know, both sides are able to save face because they were able to come together. And it should never have taken this long, but, you know, it finally happened. And um, and basically what happened was is that the uh, the final compromise deal, it sets up a new fund for human trafficking victims where... The way that this works is that, like, you've got some funding that is, like, you know, coming from these, like, criminal fines that they're imposing on, you know, on the traffickers. And that, but that money can only be used for legal services. And then they have a separate funding stream that is, you know, you know going to cover um, health services. And for that, they're saying that, okay, like, you know, that money is going to basically adopt the old. Hyde Amendment language saying that, okay, you know, the federal government does not fund m- money for abortions except in cases of rape or incest or the mother's life is in danger. Um, and so, you know, it's these two funding streams. It's um, a little bit of like kind of civic Sudoku, if you want to call it that. But it is good news because like we're finally going to be like doing right by, you know, I mean, for uh, victims of human trafficking, which um, I think that is an accomplishment in, um, you know, Sexual Violence Awareness Month. I think that, you know, I mean, it's it's an important development um, for compromise. And, uh, you know, and I'm hoping that as, you know, we, as we move forward, we can have better discussions about, you know, um, you know, about reproductive health care, that we don't use it as this like political football, because, you know, these are people who have suffered some of the worst that other people can do to another person. And we seem to stumble over ourselves when it comes to like providing them basic reproductive health care. And it really shouldn't be that hard, guys. It really, really shouldn't be so hard to do right by people who have suffered the worst. Um, But, you know, I am grateful to um, the Senate for finally reaching a deal and putting this together. And, you know, I just hope that the people involved who need to make this happen and get it cracking do so um, real fast because, uh, you know, I think that these victims have waited way too long. All right. So we've covered a lot today. I know that, you know, this has been some he- pretty heavy stuff between, uh, you know, the uh, Battle of the Op-Eds and the Hill newspaper when it comes to, you know, gun safety uh, being a public health issue versus the, you know, gun nuts and the gun lobby saying that it is not. Uh, you know, we've been covering the uh, the vaccine issue going off in uh, California and, you know, kind of trying to prove the point that the gun nuts and the anti-vaxxers are sharing a very, very dangerous common ground where, you know, they're not realizing that, yeah, you know, like you can't have it your way every day all the time, that there is going to come a point where we have to acknowledge that common sense, science, and decency dictate that we set up some rules that protect the broader good. You can't send your kid to school with the gun, and you can't send your kid to school with the measles. And you know what? Your personal beliefs, if they differ with that, you're going to have to, you know, I mean, just kind of deal with it. I mean, that is the way that our society functions. And, it, you know, we can't reach a point where we're trying to satisfy every single person's every single belief and, you know, never reach, you know, a compromise. So, um, you know, I'm glad that we took some time to cover that. I'm glad some, that we took the time to cover um, Sexual Violence Prevention Month. I think that that's, you know, really important. I'm glad that we were able to discuss it from the standpoint of looking at it as a public health issue and to really discuss it from the standpoint of prevention. You know, when we look at um, how well we've done with driver's ed and, you know, teaching teenagers how to be safe drivers so that, you know, they can avoid, you know, um, I mean, getting injured in a traffic accident, I think that, you know, there's a lot to be learned from that experience and mimicking it for um, sexual assault is really, really important. And then uh, and then finally, we covered the um, the justice for uh, human trafficking, uh, you know, for victims of human trafficking act. 
Um, again, you know, it's one of those things that it should never have taken as long as it did. Um, it's, you know, pretty disgraceful that, you know, it took this long. But at the same time, I'm glad that some kind of a pr- compromise was finally reached because, um, you know, these are people who have suffered the worst and deserve the best of us. So I'm glad that we were able to do that. Um I want to thank you guys for hanging in there. I know this has been like kind of an interesting episode where we've kind of like covered a lot of different things on the map. Um, but um, I hope that, you know, you this like sparks some conversations about where do your personal beliefs, you know, end and where does the greater public good begin and how do we, you know, reconcile that. So I'm going to leave you with that deep, deep question. And until next time, <laughs> this is the Dr. America Show here on the WEAC Radio Network. I've been your host, Dr. Sanjeev Sriram. And until next week, salud to your health. to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. Smoke.